I'm chairing the next session. But before I do, a couple of, couple of quick things uh, to, uh, to plug, if I may. Um, the, the Nuffield uh, participates in the uh, Hartness Scholarships uh, with the Commonwealth Fund. Uh, Robin Osborne, I don't know if I can't, again, I can't see. Robin, are you here? I can't see her. She's around. Um, yeah. Um, this is a great opportunity for sort of mid-career people to go and do uh, a piece of research on health policy delivery uh, w with a leading U US health service researcher. Uh, it's it's, it's a, a great mid-career opportunity for an academic or for a, 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 or a manager or a medic. Uh, there's a number of uh, ex heartness people around. Uh, James Mountford, Emma Stanton are, uh, are here. I think there may be others if you are. Make yourself known. Anyone else? Oh, as Garrett Lewis, of course, yeah. Oh, and and uh, excellent. So, and Ruth, yeah, good. I would say, have a, uh, do think about this as a, an opportunity for providing development for, for, for people. Um, it's a lot of work for them. It's quite a big commitment for them and their organisation, but uh, uh, something that we're very pleased to be associated with. So, uh, uh, so uh, let me encourage you to uh, pick out one of the leaflets, uh, uh, find and talk to Robin uh, uh, Osborne if you have the opportunity uh, uh, to do so. Uh, she'll be very happy to, uh, to talk to you about that. I can confidently say with her, not in the room, but I'm sure she will. But, uh, uh, the second thing I, we just wanted to tell you about was a, a, a new initiative, uh, uh, which again I'm going, I can take glory for from other people's, uh, other people's uh, work, which is a, the development of a, a, a panel of 100 uh, healthcare leaders uh, which we're going to use to help us think about uh, uh, the po policy run-up to the uh, 2015 uh, general election so that we, we get a, a good cross-section of, 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 of views and, and be able to sort of ensure that the analysis that we do is grounded in, uh, in, in, in the reality of, uh, of, of frontline experience. So um, if you're interested in that, again, uh, talk to Daniel Reynolds or one of the... Uh, uh, who's comms director or one of the other uh, Nuffield staff, let us know um, if you're interested in, uh, interested in that. We want to keep the, the numbers relatively limited and obviously it needs to be a, a reasonable cross-section. So uh, there's an extent to which uh, we'll have to balance that against demand. Um, the, uh, the next uh, session is about uh, who's driving strategic change uh, in, in the NHS. Um, one of the things that was very striking when you talked to Andrew Lansley is that he had a, a very strong view about strategy and, in particular, uh, strategic health authorities. Um, uh, so he had this kind of uh, sort of... <laughs> this, the, the, this regional strategic health authority chief executive sat in a hollowed-out volcano plotting the, uh, uh, the closure of hospitals and, and, and generally uh, uh, was up to no good. Um, uh, and it was very much embedded in a view he had that uh, actually planning wasn't really very necessary, that the, uh, that the, the, the individual decisions made by patients and their GPs would shape the system. Um, and that, under, that, that underlies quite a lot of the, uh, the original thinking in, in the architecture that he was, uh, he was designing. Um, and some work that I've been doing in... Uh, uh, with Chris Ham in London, uh, uh, looking at this question of who is a system leader, who provides system leadership when you need to make big decisions, uh, uh, really kind of confirmed that there was an issue. Um, this is a gestalt. You don't need to read the boxes. You just need to say, how does that work? <laughs> Where do I start? Um, so lots of different actors, all with different perspectives, um, all with a different view about, uh, about how change is managed, quite often with a different view about what the objectives were, and, and no particularly well-established rules of behaviour, of engagement, of keeping people to agreements and, uh, uh, and, and making sure that there's some, there's some forward progress. So the purpose of this session, which I've been asked to facilitate, is, is more interactive. We're going, to, we're going to involve you in helping us think about uh, uh, three questions, which is, uh, is, is the is there really a problem with system leadership? And if so, is that an issue? Is it really a problem? Um, if it is, how are people dealing with it? And uh, the, third, uh, the third thing is, what are the consequences of that in terms of what would we perhaps like to say about this issue uh, to the uh, two politicians who follow this session? 
uh, 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 Jeremy Hunt and, and the Burnham. So that's, uh, and it's an opportunity also, I think we, uh, the, the, the organisers of the conference were very keen to actually do a bit of, get you talking to each other as well, because the, the morning's been quite full on, uh, so there's a bit more of an opportunity for you to, uh, to, to, to share some experiences of, uh, of what's going on. So to sort of set us off, we've got uh, Mike Deegan uh, from Central Manchester, who's also an Trust. trustee, he's just going to give his perspective on how that... Uh, uh, that rather interesting map translates into real experience in Manchester. Mike. Th thanks, Nigel. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Nigel said, I'll just try and paint a picture for what the current situation looks like in Greater Manchester. And hopefully it will become clear, as uh, Nigel's diagram demonstrated, there's an awful lot of people on the pitch. Um, as that guy from Genesis this morning said, there's not one <laughs> individual in charge, so that means we've got to work really hard around alignment. And also thirdly, the further you get away from the actual point of care in a locality, the more difficult it is to create that level of alignment and drive the change forward. Okay, across Greater Manchester, we're a tightly packed conurbation, population between three and four million, we have 13 different hospitals of sorts, 12 different newly formed clinical commissioning groups, 10 established local authorities, three mental health trusts. So quite a lot of even just standard NHS bodies on the pitch, let alone other organisations. When we start looking at how we drive change forward across Greater Manchester, I think when you focus within a locality for example, Salford, central Manchester, where more often than not you may have one local authority, one clinic clinical commissioning group, one acute trust. I think there's some really innovative work in terms of how we develop more joined up packages of care that are genuinely centered around the patient and their carer. I think that's probably because we've got a clear common purpose in those patches. When we move to the next level, and then we look for change across a conurbation about that size, that's where I think some of the real tensions and difficulties start to get drawn out. And really, just to give an insight into just to share programming, uh, Great Manchester, which we locally call the Healthier Together program. Um, and part of that is looking at a reconfiguration of hospital services across Greater Manchester. And it's been formally sponsored by all the clinical commissioning groups, the specialist commissioners, and it's got active involvement of every hospital provider in that overall programme of work. Um, and that's really starting to identify some of the tensions that Nigel started to talk about earlier. Um, so how we're trying to move that forward, some, some again real progress and a platform to move forward. So the 12 CCGs having governance terms come together They've created a committee in common, so they're now statutorily able to make reconfiguration decisions that bind them all together. All our local authorities have come together under the Association of Greater Manchester Authorities and signed up to a potential decision-making basis. And all the providers come together under a reference group that's chaired by Ruth Carnell, um, and we've all been actively involved in the process. And we've even reached the stage where we've shared all our, our adherence to basic um, clinical standards, for example, around general surgery. And we've now got a common picture across all the hospitals in Greater Manchester of the extent to which we adhere to existing standards. We've also shared all our outcome data. So we know the variation, say, in uh, mortality from emergency admissions. We've also shared all our financial plans. So at one level, we've got a really good basis to move forward. But the reality is we're not quite into the real game yet. And when we move to the stage of saying, hold on, how do we have fewer major 24-7 hospital sites and a larger number of hospitals that aren't DGHs but are local hospitals with really care managed across those organisations, not within the institution. As you would imagine, we're starting to get into some real difficult ground at the moment. 
So CCGs are having to balance their responsibility to their local communities and the prospect of moving some local services elsewhere. NHS England are also on the pitch. They have a local area team and it's really interesting to see how their relationship is moving forward with individual CCGs. Across all the hospitals, the majority of us are foundation trusts and the reality is we've all spent the last best part of a decade focusing more on competition than collaboration as a way forward. And again, most people who work in foundation trusts see their accountability back to the institution, not to the overall system. So that's highlighting some real difficulties in getting all hospitals to sign up to what looks like some sensible change. As well as those core NHS stakeholders, as you would all expect, Monitor, the Foundation Trust Regulator, is active in this regard. And there are several organisations either technically in failure in Greater Manchester or on the second stage investigation by Monitor. The Trust Development Authority are also on the pitch. They're looking at how the one or two hospitals that aren't FTs can become FTs. There's also more very recently been uh, launched reviews of um, non-sustainable local healthcare systems that both Monitor and the TDA are involved in. When we talk about this change in Manchester, I have to go back to our Health and Wellbeing Board and report through to elected members on the local authority. So as you can see, we're accumulating all the people on the pitch that we need to get aligned on this. But the last set of reforms that Nigel described We've now also got all our clinical reference groups, our operational delivery networks, clinical senates, all real potential drivers for change, but all need aligning. So I guess, Nigel, just in introduction, we're at the stage in Greater Manchester where we recognise um, many, many organisations on the pitch. The key will be how on earth we can develop a way to just coalesce all our interest so we're no longer just looking after our patch that we may be technically accountable for and how we can sign up to broader change across the conurbation. One final comment, if I may, Nigel, because often when we have this discussion in the NHS, um, people start to talk about the role of the intermediate tier, which, of course, was you know, um, um, seen away in the last set of reforms. And I do think it's a really interesting level of discussion. Because when we look at the intermediate tier, which by and large covered a population of about you know, four to five million, you know, there were some areas, and I feel quite fortunate of having been in this position in the Northwest, where we had a SHA that tried to create a really permissive enabling framework and really helped organizations come up with strategically astute outcomes. But clearly other parts of the NHS seem to operate in a different way. And the intermediate tier, which could undertake a critical planning role, was a bit more focused on core performance management and not strategic oversight. So hopefully, Nigel, that just gives a local illustration of the amount of players on the pitch and how all this starts to come together or Mike, not. Mike, you had one other observation about the experience from the Euro Summit about scale. Do you know just... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> really interesting. At the Nuffield Trust Euro Summit earlier this year, um, Quite a lot of colleagues from um, different countries, different um, organisations were talking about how they started to develop effective strategic planning mechanisms. And I spent about the first day of that summit thinking about how we would create effective strategic planning structures in the NHS, thinking about the 50 million population. But when you spoke to the individuals, by one exception, Every other European country talked about units of about four or five million in terms of strategic planning. And when we talked about you know, doing it on a, size of a, a country the size of England, they were quite like taken aback. Which that was we the think about it. Is it in northern Spain? Is it, yeah, I think it was. But that's probably, that's probably 2.5 million. It's Catalonia. Yeah, yeah right.